The starting rotation looks to be set, but that leaves several unanswered questions in the bullpen. We're going to try and answer them on today's Locked on Reds. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Reds. My name is Jeff Carr. His name is Steve Hoffenbaker, and we are glad that you are alongside us here today. The two of us have extensive experience podcasting about the Cincinnati Reds and are lifelong fans. Seriously, we've given far too much thought and far too much brain space to this team, but that's why we're here. We love talking Reds, and we're glad that you're alongside us here today because on today's Locked On Reds podcast, which, by the way, brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network, we are your team every single day. On today's show, we are going to look at the performances from 2024 and tell you who's overrated and who's underrated. Actually, I haven't done this since the end of the season. I don't know how we lasted till Thanksgiving week waiting to well, do this. Episode, the Reds have given us more news than we uh, ever thought they were going to. Yes, they have. And alongside that news come some question marks of things that the Reds need to fix, namely in the bullpen. That's all coming up on today's Locked On Reds that is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return over on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win that first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And what we'll get started today, Steve, is with the bullpen reset because there were some moves, you know, Ian Jabot non-tendered, some guys becoming free agents and things like that. We've got to reset what this bullpen looks like because they're looking a little shorthanded. Yeah, so when you look at the construction of a major league roster, 26 players, 13 of them have to be pitchers, 13 of them have to be position players. Uh, you take your 13 pitchers, you carve out your five starters, right? That leaves you with a magic number of eight. That is your bullpen. And as the, the landscape has changed in Cincinnati between the final game of the season and now, what we know, or at least anticipate, is that six of those spots are filled, Jeff. They've mm -hmm. got six guys that are here that have a job and that are going to be in this bullpen. And it's, it's pretty easy when you look at it. Maybe the last guy on this list we can debate here in just a second. But those six guys are Alexis Diaz. He has a job. He's going to be here. Sam Mall, not going anywhere. Brett Suter has been re-signed. He's pitching for the Reds out of the bullpen. Tony Santion, I absolutely believe, has earned a place to stay in this bullpen in 2025. Emilio Pagan, he is going to be back. And here we get to the guy that maybe we can question. So that's five. Number six of the guys that are on the roster and, and in the bullpen is Fernando Cruz. And my question to you is, after what you saw from him, and I know at the beginning he was lights out, but he fell off a table much like that pitch was in May. His splitter was falling off a table, and then it stopped, and he fell off a table because he was not good. He was not good at all after that. Are you penciling him in? Does Are you giving him a job right now? I kind of think it's de facto right now. Um, he definitely has stuff. His stuff is amazing. He still had one of the best strikeout rates in the league, much less on the team. It's just the walks were an issue. And also he has a really high BABIP and it's the second year in a row that that's the case because for two straight years, the ERA like peripheral numbers say that his ERA was unlucky. But it's two straight years of that now. It's kind of hard to be like, well, it's going to turn around because if it goes two straight years of the ERA not looking all that great, what's the third year going to be? You know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I, I think by de facto, he's in here because when you look at the 40-man roster, the list of guys who are currently on that, I mean, is Carson Spires better than him? Is no. Casey Legamina better than him? Lion Richardson, Yasmer Zulueta, is Luis May? Better than him? Those are the only other guys on the 40-man roster. Luis May might be the only name on that list that could challenge for a job. But let me ask you this before we move off Fernando Cruz and talk about these last two spots. Mm -hmm. Does he get a pass? Are you willing to attribute what happened to him last season to David Bell overuse early in the year? I think so. Like You could pencil him in as a middle relief guy, especially if you go make a move or two, whether it's moving a certain guy to the bullpen or signing a certain guy. Um, the only issue is it kind of feels like there's a few of these guys that, I mean, Tony Santion, I'm excited about, 
but how quickly do you want to ramp up his, you know, average leverage that he faces against Brent Suter dealt with injuries last year. Emilio Pagan dealt with injuries last year. So I don't feel like there's a, a workhorse in this bullpen, like David Bell, like kind of forced Fernando Cruz to be. So I think there's definitely going to be a little bit more of a rotation of that. I think Cruz has the stuff. They just need to work on like one thing there, the, the whole walks issue. All right. Well, you, you mentioned a workhorse and because this was an election year, let's do it this way. Jeff locked on reds is ready to call the seventh bullpen slot. <laughs> 2025 Cincinnati reds. Yes, we are. Tim Ashcraft is going to be the workhorse back of the bullpen to pair with Alexis Diaz. I, I, I think this is a, a, a great move for Graham Ashcraft, Jeff. I think this is where he's going to end up. This is what the team is going to do with him. You don't have to look very hard at the tea leaves of what the moves have been with the starting rotation to see that Graham Ashcraft is not in the equation. Uh, no. And I don't see him being in the minor leagues either. So if he's not a starter and he's not in the minor leagues, he's going to the bullpen. And I think he can actually thrive in the bullpen for the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, because he is an all out guy. Like one of the things that we love about him and one of the things that everybody uses sometimes I think incorrectly uses this term, but they always call him a bulldog. And I think part of that bulldog mentality is he wants to throw every pitch at 110%. He wants to go get you no matter what the situation is. He's not trying to pitch around you. He's trying to go get you. And in order to do that, I feel like for a guy like him, you got to rein him in and say, all right, look, we don't need six out of you. If you can just get one time through the order, if that's two innings, if that's three innings, whatever that looks like, then we're golden. Right. And I think we don't he, need, we don't need six innings. We need six outs. Yes. Yes, exactly. And, and, and he would fit into the role. If you remember the role before his Tommy John surgery journey that he's he's been on here now for a couple of years, TJ Antone's role in this bullpen was not as closer. It was as the, we need you to shut this team down. And oh, by the way, if you can go more than three outs, then that's cool too. Graham Ashcraft would be perfect for that role. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. You know, for guys, gals, folks that have followed this team that are around my age, you know, he's like Tom Browning for, for the younger folk. Uh, he has the same mentality of Wade Miley. He gets in there, he works, he works hard, he works fast and he goes at 115%, right? Um, he's that type of a pitcher and what that's not conducive to, uh, in uh, outside of rare occasions in this modern major league baseball is being able to do that for three times through a lineup, um, right. being able to do that, you know, Six innings well, and that's why he's so streaky, right? Like he might have one, yeah. two, three good starts, but then he's going to have one, two, three bad starts because it's all going to culminate and he has to kind of, you know, survive for a minute. So I, I love the idea of seeing him in, I don't know, 50 games, 60 games, mm -hmm. pitching an inning or two and just coming in and working. You know, we, we've said this team needs somebody to pair with Alexis Diaz, not a, not a setup man but somebody to pitch on the days that Alexis isn't so that Alexis is still Alexis towards the postseason. You put both of these guys at the back of the Reds bullpen, that's a bit of a game changer, especially with a starting rotation that's got a couple guys in it. it can give you six or seven innings now. Hunter Green can go six or seven innings. I, I think there's a couple other guys that are going to be there this year as well. The bullpen's starting to look good. So where that leaves us, Jeff, is that's seven. But that leaves a spot. So I think you and I are both in agreement that that spot is Mr. Outside Hire. Yeah, because that's th this is where I was surprised that they non-tendered Ian Jabot. And I, I fall back on maybe there is more something to his injuries that he dealt with last year. Maybe he's not done dealing with them. Maybe there's still more to come. And that's why they non-tendered him, because that should be Ian Jabot's spot. I mean, ideally, the, and the other issue too, is like, you could debate the merits of Fernando Cruz. So at that point, would you even need to go get two guys? But definitely you need to get one because the equation is this, the Reds have to replace 167 innings in the bullpen guys who pitched, you know, I'm just going to say double digit. And he's not the guys who came up, pitched like three games and then got sent back down. You know, the Brandon Lee Brands of the world, the, the car, the Casey Kelly's and things like that. Like Buck farmer, Justin Wilson, Lucas Sims. Now they could bring back a Buck farmer or a Lucas Sims. They could even bring back a Jacob Junis, 
But if they don't bring back any of those guys, you're talking about a lot of innings that you need to fill. So that's 167 innings that you would put Graham Ashcraft into, you would put Mr. Outside Hire into, and you would have to spread out amongst the guys. And we also know for a fact, Steve, that not all these guys are going to go through the entire season completely unscathed. You're going to need depth. So there's going to be some claim, some waiver claims. There's going to be some minor league signings, things like that. But I kind of feel like they need to go get themselves, maybe not a top flight guy, but a legitimate, you know, lower end type dude. I think it's also important to make mention what we're not doing is saying that Nick Martinez is going to pit, make appearances no. out of the bullpen. Uh, he's a starter now, gang. Um, I have been seeing some stuff out there that speculates the Reds will use him the same way they used him last year. Absolutely not. They are not taking the $21 million man and putting him in the bullpen. He has a rotation spot, especially after the way he pitched at the end of the year. So we're not even going to entertain that idea. Um, I'd be the first to stand up and say that's a waste. That would be a yeah, bad idea. Absolute, absolute waste. Here's, here's what we know. They still need another guy. They might need to. And Nick Craw needs to get busy. It's going to be a very interesting offseason as time continues to pass on by. February, Jeff, is really not that far away. And this bullpen still needs a little help. When we look back at 2024, we have a couple players. Jeff has a couple players. I have a couple players that we have thought are overrated and are underrated. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the guys we think might have been a bit too overrated. Get ready to tackle NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 back in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. And while you're there, check out next year's World Series odds. Those Reds, 60 to 1 odds, might be worth putting a few bucks on them to win it all in 2025. Just saying, might be a good time to get on that. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets backs if your first bet of $5 wins. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. We're talking Cincinnati Reds baseball here today, every day, every week, every month, all year long, off season, spring training, regular season, and Lord willing playoffs. We'll be talking Reds baseball in the playoffs. Yeah, I said playoffs. Uh, if you're not following us, playoffs. please click that subscribe button. Click that notification bell. Click that like button. We love talking Reds baseball with you. We want to continue to do that. All right, Jeff overrated let's talk a little bit about the reds most overrated players because there are a few and i'm gonna go first because i have said from last year that this guy was overrated i said from last year he's really just a 4a player in a major league uniform i said from last year that i did not understand the love affair that some of this fan base has with Stuart fairchild and Stuart Fairchild is my most overrated player. He continues to be my most overrated player. Listen, this guy played in 57 whopping games against right-handed pitching in 2024. Sir, that is not a small sample size. And in that sample size, he had a slash line of 152, 213, 293 for an OPS plus, if you take his split, so we'll call it S, OPS plus, of 42. 42 he was not good you add into <sighs> that his defensive lapses jeff mm, yeah and there were several uh he comes off now now look i'm not gonna go to the airwaves here and call a guy not smart I'm not gonna say that he's unintelligent what i am gonna say is he lacks baseball smarts and he lacks situational awareness and we saw it play out several times to the detriment of the team. Right. So for me, I can't for the life of me figure out how there's still people out there saying this guy needs to be the starting outfielder for the Cincinnati Reds. It, it, it's 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 a non-starter for me. No, and he he was he was unplayable against right-handed pitching. Like you mentioned, I mean, those stats were only just a little bit better than Mike Ford. And we all remember how that experience went. Ooh. Um yeah, and <laughs> 
I mean, defensively too, that's the tough part for me is that it felt like the athleticism is just, uh, it's way up there. He's, he's one of the most athletic players in this organization, but you can't out athlete everything. And at some point you've got to have the right focus, the right frame of mind. And it felt like at certain points there weren't those, that wasn't the case. And, you know, I, I can specifically point to, you know, in Milwaukee when he makes the wrong throw or different times where he missed the cutoff man, because he thought he could get it there and it just wasn't even close. So th- there's moments like that, that made me wonder a little bit that did he get too much playing time? Yeah, and I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation either. You know, if we were talking about little league, high school ball, even college ball, Jeff, yeah. these are these are guys that are out there playing the game and they're young and they're learning and and mistakes happen, right? And even at the big league level, mistakes happen, but I saw a pattern. I saw it happen enough times that it, you know, it wasn't a one-time thing. It was not a one-off. It makes me really question his situational awareness. And when you're a professional, when that's your job, you, you don't get that pass that you give those younger guys. So I don't give him that pass. And it, it continues to baffle me the way that there's a, a segment, a following, a, a fan base of his that continues to lobby for him to get more, to be more than he really is. And I think it just makes it, it just it makes for a silly argument for me sometimes, Jeff. Well, and along those lines, um, the fan base loves this guy and, and actually He was just signed to avoid arbitration. So, and and the way that the numbers worked out, I think that the Reds don't overvalue him, but it's Santiago Espinal. There's too many people that want to see this guy start. There's too many people that want to see this guy play every day. He's fine. He's, he's actually in some cases he's, he's below average. He's got a 77 OPS plus. He's not a guy that I want to see play every day, but he's a guy that I feel good about having him come off the bench. But I think that there's a a section of the fan base that really thinks that this guy can do it. And look, he's got the craziest of splits when it comes to time, because for the second half of the season, much of the second half of the season, the month of July, he hit 432. The month of August, he hit 339. So for two months, he was like elite with an OPS of like almost a thousand for two straight months. And you're like, how could you be mad about this guy? Because in the month of April, he had a buck 85 batting average. He was, got a little bit better in the month of May, hit 222. Oh, and then, and then in June, he went back down and hit a buck 73. For much of the season, he offset those two months. And I remember we did we did bits of episodes and segments of episodes where like, well, man, how about Santiago Espinal? He's kind of killing it here in this July and in this August and all this other stuff. But for much of the year, he showed you why he's a bench player. So don't put, don't, don't put the cart in front of the horse when it comes to Santiago Espinal. He's a solid depth player. He does not need to be looked at as well. If so-and-so doesn't pan out, we got Santiago Espinal who can play every day. Yeah, that would be a a critical mistake. If you look at Santiago Espinal that way, I'm, 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 I'm with you on this in as far as the cries of him being a starter. What I will tell you is he is a valuable bench guy. Uh, Defensively, you can use him as defensive replacement. His glove is pretty good, Jeff. Um, But but here's how the Reds, I hope, start using him. Because, you know, we've talked a lot about other players having this thing. But if you put Santiago Espinal in the right spots to be successful, he -hmm. can be. And I'm going to tell you what those right spots are. When you let him bat, when you let him get in the batter's box, it needs to be against a left-handed pitcher. Because if you look at how he performed in 70 games against left-handed pitching in 2024, he had a slash line of 290, 344, 491 with an SOPS plus of 133. He was 33% better than the rest of the league against left-handed pitching. That's where you play him. That's how you use him. You bring him off the bench against left-handed pitchers. You bring him off the bench late in games to give you a good glove on the field. And if he gets in at bat against the lefty, that's even bonus. Uh, That's how I use Santiago Espinal. Valuable, valuable bench guy. Much better now that he negotiated a deal versus fighting out the arbitration process. Uh, But a starter, he is not. 
No, and I, I do remember too, like I was making the point that the Reds should non-tender him, move on from him. But part of that thought process also stemmed from, I didn't think they were going to trade Jonathan India. Like I'm sure, I, I knew we were going to hear rumors, but I kind of thought they were married to the idea of at least one more year with India. And so if you kept India, you couldn't keep Espinal because Espinal is really what you wanted India to be. Espinal can play multiple positions. His glove is fine. It's not good, but it's fine at those positions. And he can hit solidly in certain cases. But like I mentioned, not an everyday guy. Please do not play him. Every yeah. In, in the 70 games against lefties, phenomenal. In 100 games against righties, 226, 270, 292. Man can hit righties. They need to treat him like they treat, like they treat Stuart Fairchild against righties. Don't do it. Leave him on the bench, wait for the lefty to come into the game. But I know this, Steve, when it comes to overrated, that means that there's some underrated players too. And we got a couple of those guys coming up next. If you cannot watch us on YouTube, you can catch us on your favorite podcasting app. We're literally on every single one of them. Follow us there today. And while we're talking about overrated, underrated, things like that, coming up on Friday, we have a live show coming for you on Black Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern time sure, or 3 p.m. <laughs> 2 p.m. is 2 fine. 2 p.m. Eastern time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Sorry, we should have nailed that down before I hit that tease. But yeah, 2 p.m. Eastern time live show. Want to hear from you. Who do you think are, are we just off base about our overrated, underrated? Who do you think's overrated, underrated? I'm guessing there's going to be some folks getting here and talk about how overrated Ellie De La Cruz is. And y'all wrong about that. But whatever, you guys go ahead. You're going to do things that I can't control anyway. But. There are some underrated guys because we talked about overrated. There are a couple of underrated guys. And I'm going to start with this because while you were talking about them, I was thinking, but Steve, Stuart Fairchild against left-handed pitching is who we're looking for. 273, 350, 436. And he did that in 69 games when it comes to Stuart Fairchild against left-handed pitching. Plus... You add in the fact that last year, defensively, at least according to Baseball Savant in the outs above average metric, he was in the top 20% of the league in outs above average. He had a four outs above average. He was in the top 8% of the league for sprint speed. And he don't chase much. This guy does not swing at pitches that are outside the zone. He's got a nice, he's got a nice eye at the plate. He is the kind of guy that I think does need to be on this roster. Doesn't need to play every day. I'm not saying that, but I think at least for my part, I look back on how I assessed Stuart Fairchild. I wasn't very much different from you during the season when it came to Stuart Fairchild. I was agreeing with you that I, I thought he was a quadruple A player, but I have backed off of that. I don't think he's quadruple A. I think this dude needs to be on this roster. You know, if you blind, if you blind trialed me and I'm surprised you didn't, um, you could have gotcha me if you had done it this way, but if you just take his, his numbers against left-handed pitching again, 273, 350, 436, that's 21% better than league average using that S OPS plus number. And because it's the off season and we have a second, what that is, is when you take the OPS plus and you go to splits mode and you're looking at splits, well, that's just accounting for the split. So in this case, looking at his left-handed numbers Compared against the it, rest yeah. of the league, He's 21% better than everybody else, better than league average. So against for me, yeah. against left-handed pitching. So if you had gotcha me, you would have gotcha me because that's I would take that player. I would say that guy could be a very valuable fourth, fifth outfielder on a team to have around. Not a starter all the time, but that's a guy that you could keep around. Now, if you want to sell me on this, we would have to talk about where you play him in the outfield because, mm -hmm. like I said in the last segment, I think he lacks situational awareness and I think he lacks baseball smart sometimes. And if you play him in that. center field, he's in charge of the outfield. He's in charge of calling guys off baseballs. He's Don't in charge that. of kind of keeping track of things. You can't play him in center field. If you're going to have him on the team and you're going to play him, he needs to be in a corner. Uh, right field sounds fine. I think you mm -hmm. stick him over there in right field and you let him play against left-handed pitching. He could be valuable, much like the argument I just made for Santiago Espinal, right? It's, it's the same, right. same, same, same argument here. 
The and the other thing about why I believe he was underrated because we we poo pooed him a lot during the year, but as much as he did make some boneheaded plays, he also made some spectacular plays. I mean, we all remember that home run that he robbed in center field. He can still do that in right field if the ball's at the right field and he's in right field. Uh, but he has the propensity, he has the ability to make the spectacular. It's can he can he like kind of stifle the boneheaded errors, the unforced errors, the mistakes that nobody was making. And then all of a sudden he's like, wait, there are how many outs in the inning? I mean, you're a professional baseball player, dude. You should know how many outs there are in the inning. I think Terry Francona is going to help with that. I think across the board, the, the different lacks of focus and this and that with one player or the other, Terry Francona is at least going to be able to help mitigate that a little bit. I'm not saying he's going to get rid of it, but I'm saying I think we're going to see a lot less of that this year. And if we see a lot less of that from Stuart Fairchild, he hits against lefties and he's playing in right field, that is the perfect role for him like fifth outfield type kind of guy. Of course, the question is who you're going to pair with them. That's probably a conversation for a later date. though. As a matter of fact, why don't we make that a conversation on Friday's live show, 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Eastern right here yeah. on the YouTubes. Uh, make sure you save some time and join us because we want to hear from you on this as well. Uh, there is a way for Stuart Fairchild to be valuable, and we can talk about that on Friday's live show. But listen, Jeff, there is another guy that I think has been very, very underrated as far as being a member of the Cincinnati Reds. It's going to blow your mind, actually. Um, I think this guy has uh, immense talent. I think we've only seen the beginnings of it, the tip of the iceberg, as you will. And I think that Cincinnati has done what Cincinnati does a lot of times with players like this, and they don't appreciate what they got until it's gone. The most underrated player on this team is Ellie De La Cruz, and I am going to tell you why. This guy has not even begun to realize his potential. Going, but I, love that. I love that. He's he has all of the ability to be an MVP in this league, and and yet there are segments out there, and it's not just Reds fans, it's baseball fans, it's other team haters. It's it's when when you're the high profile guy, people want to attack you. Uh, oh, he got thrown out too much, too many caught stealings. Ellie De La Cruz has created more chaos to the benefit of the Cincinnati Reds in one season than other players are able to manage in their career. I don't want this to be another Joey Votto. I'm putting it out there right now. People didn't appreciate Joey until it was clear he was going to be gone. And Joey Votto was here for a long time as one of the greatest players to ever play for this franchise. Ellie De La Cruz is another one of those dudes. And we need to lean into that right now. We need to understand he is going to be a multi-time all-star. He is going to be an MVP. He is going to be a guy that can change the direction of a franchise. And if Nick Crawl gets it right this offseason, if Nick Crawl builds the rest of this team around that dude, this team is going to make the playoffs. And I can't wait to watch Ellie De La Cruz wreak freaking havoc in the playoffs. <laughs> I, Jeff, I'm hyped up. When is opening day? Let's go. What wall Let's can go. I run through right now? No, and, and and you are absolutely right. And and I think that there, there are two distinctions here because there are some people that are just like, but but this and that and the other. There's a difference between overhyped and underrated. And I think that there's a tendency to believe that they're the same thing. They are not the same thing. You you listen to guys like us, and I'll admit. I love Ellie De La Cruz, and I don't think there is a limit to his abilities. I don't think there's a limit to what he can do on the baseball field. So for some, that means that I'm overhyping him. I will admit that. But that doesn't mean that he is overrated because what he did on the field last year, if you take him off this team, the Reds don't win. I, I think they probably win like 15, 20 less games. And I get it that war is supposed to be that sort of a value, but not necessarily straight up. At the beginning of the season, I made the bold prediction that somebody would be worth six wins above replacement or more for the season. According to Baseball Reference, Elliot Ella Cruz just missed. According to Fangraphs, he hit. He had 6.4 F war, 5.2 B war. But that's based on the fact that he led the league in strikeouts because everybody wants to come back with that. They want to talk about how much he strikes out. They want to talk about all the errors that he made. He did all that, and he still got that much war. Can you imagine? With an off-season of Terry Francona, spring training of Terry Francona, maybe even a year. Who knows? He might not be there this year. But in 2026, we could see Jose Ramirez level Ellie De La Cruz. And I think that there's some folks that don't realize 
what that means because Jose Ramirez is one of the three best players in this league. Yes, I said three. There's Aaron Judge, there's Shohei Otani, there's Jose Ramirez. He's better than Juan Soto. He's better than anybody else you can name. He's better than Mookie Betts. Jose Ramirez, and I know that's a baseball-wide take. There's probably not a lot of Reds fans that are going to go crazy about that. But Jose Ramirez, for his career, has 51 and a half war. And he's only play, he's played for 11 years, 51 and a half war. Dude's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's one of the best baseball players that we've seen in this era. And that is who I'm looking at. Terry Francona could make Ellie De La Cruz into, if not even better. So I don't think that there is a limit to his rating. There's going to be people that say he's overhyped, but he is never overrated. You know, those that have listened to us for a long time, Jeff, know that I use 60 war as my magic number for Mm -hmm. the Baseball Hall of Fame. And if Ellie De La Cruz plays 12 years, he's going to get 60 war. There's, yeah. there's no question in my mind. 12 healthy Ellie seasons equals 60 war. So for me, I, I again, encourage this fan base to lean in to Ellie De La Cruz. Don't come at me with, well, are they going to keep him? They're just going to trade him. I don't care. While he's While here, he's, he's going to be ridiculous. Amazing. So let, let's, let's not make the same mistakes that we made with Joey Votto with Ellie De La Cruz. Let's, let's get on the hype train and enjoy this guy because it's going to be an amazing ride. I 1000% agree. And that's the way to end today's podcast. Thanks everybody for checking out today's lockdown reds podcast. Like we mentioned coming up Friday at 2 PM Eastern time on black Friday, we're going to have a live episode. Well, uh, we'll take your reactions to our overrated, underrated. We'll also tell you how Stuart Fairchild can be a valuable asset to this team. And we'll look at a couple of other things about the off season for your Cincinnati reds. Maybe we'll go Black Friday shopping for uh, for Reds free agents or something like that. I don't know what something. Is there going to be a sale? Way. There's going to be a sale. Yeah, probably not. Anyway, <laughs> that's going to do it for us here today. Uh, we are going to be with you every step of the way, all throughout the offseason, getting you ready for what should be a playoff 2025 season for your Cincinnati Reds, because we are locked on Reds every single day. Is Nick Craw going to be like waiting in a line at three in the morning to, to buy a relief <laughs> pitcher or two? Is that what's happening? He's got a coupon. He's got a coupon. Double coupon Friday. I don't, I don't know. I don't think.